is NAB Show Live. Welcome and good morning. This is Deborah Kaufman and this is NAB Show Live, brought to you by Broadcast Beat at NAB 2019. We're going to start off with a really, really interesting topic, which is colorists. Um, everybody uses one, but it's a very subjective art. It's a black art, isn't it? It is a Colorist. hidden art, yes. Yes, it's absolutely. a hidden art. So I have with me today Kevin Shaw, who himself is a colorist, yes. and has some interesting news to talk about colorists and their cabals. Indeed. All right. So Kevin, let's start off a little bit. Why don't you tell me a little bit about who you are? Um, I presume you became a colorist in some interesting way. Yes, we all did. Nobody, well, in the old days at least, nobody ever set out to be a colorist. Nobody had ever heard of colorists. Right. Um, so I started out actually as a photographer. I have and, a degree and you're in from the UK? Or I'm you're from the UK, okay. yeah. And uh, yeah, I started out in photography and I got into studios and things and uh, discovered telecine and um, fell into uh, color grading. That was 35 years ago. For those, for those watching who are too young to remember telecine, <laughs> I remember it well. Can you just explain a little bit telecine and then the transition to what we have today? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating story because in the early days of television, there was, there was no digital recordings, obviously, but there was not even tape recordings in the early days. And so the only way to record images was on film and to get from film to television, you needed this telecine. And then as the telecine got more sophisticated, we started wanting to grade and change the colors and play with the colors. And in the television industry, that became very creative. And then the film industry wanted to get that back into cinema. And so with the advent of software-based color correction, we could then roll it out to uh, not just cinema, but internet and uh, you know, displays, all, the, all these different venues. And there was that period of time when the idea of a digital intermediate was so brand new and fresh, which was to scan the film into a digital space. That's right, Kodak. And correct yes. it. And those were, you know, really kind of revolutionary days that you could take this film and manipulate it digitally and then record back out to film. Yeah, and in many ways that was more difficult because you had to match back to the film. Now we do everything digital and it, it all has a sort of the same look about it. But matching back to film was really rocket science. And right. uh, it was very sophisticated hardware in those days. I mean, rooms of equipment. We had computers the size of fridges, you know. Yes. It was really rocket science. Well, it's really, and, and now, of course, so much can be done in telecine. I mean, the, uh, or, or rather into the, yeah, in the in, colorist in the suite, suite, in the grading yes, suite. Yes. So talk about some of the skills that, I mean, and telecine artists have, in order to become digital colorists, had to learn whole new skill sets, didn't they? Yes, I mean, in, especially in the last 10 years, I think the, um, the profession of color grading has really shifted. The responsibilities have changed. Back in the days of telecine, all you had to do was make nice pictures, then it went to an editor, visual effects, and it got finished. But nowadays, um, it usually ends up with the colorist, who not only has to make it look nice, convey the concept of the, of the project, but also has to take into account multiple deliverables, possibly HDR and SDR, um, maybe different aspect ratios, certainly different file systems, um, and then take care of all the technical stuff as well as doing the creative part. So it's very much a, a renaissance job. It is, and, and, and also the other aspect is in the early telecine days, the operator would work on his or her own, and today mm. you're interacting with the, certainly with the cinematographer and the, and the director at Cinematography times. Cinematography and directors usually, sometimes editing. Um, of course, we are also the point uh, connection with visual effects, because we're now the ones that roll that back into the, the, main, the main What line. is the relationship like with the with visual effects? Is that a collegial relationship? Is it um, a, a relationship of tension at times? Um, I think this is why the Colorist Society exists, that because we're at the end of the line and because of the traditional workflow from the telecine days, nobody really spends enough time thinking about what the colorist needs to get the best job done. So it's easy to sort of say, oh yeah, it always gets ruined at the end of the project. You know, we have a saying that um, if, if the material looks good, the cinematographer will win an award, and if it looks bad, then they'll just blame the colorist. <laughs> That's yeah. It's been the way of it. And, but it's getting better. We had a Birds of a Feather meeting here at NAB on Monday. Uh, we had seven people on the panel from very diverse backgrounds, from sort of commercial work to full-on A-title Hollywood movies, and from China all the way through to LA. So a very diverse panel. 
And we actually, as colorists, we all agree on how things need to be done. The biggest problem seems to be convincing people earlier on in post-production to work with us, to give us what we need to finish it. Well, it's kind of like a, a fix it in post writ large, isn't it, in some ways? It really is, yeah. yeah. Well, tell, tell me a bit about the Colorist Society. What, you know, what, what gave you the idea? Was, were you the founder of it then? I was the founder, yes. And, you know, in other words, how did this idea bubble to the top, and then how did you reach out to your colleagues in order to create this? Well, um, it had been something that Colorists had talked about amongst themselves for a very long time, even back in the 90s. There were internet groups where colorists would stick together and uh, bounce ideas and share knowledge and things like that. Um, and, and we were kind of satisfied with that for a little while. But um, now that the responsibility of the colorist has grown to delivering and to you know, really making sure that um, all of the clients are happy from theatrical release to streaming release to internet release, um, we felt that we have a responsibility that's not appreciated and so that was really the driving force. And then as we got further into it, we realized that, uh, for example, the birds of the feather meeting where we can get together and agree on principles, that could never happen unless there was a single professional body that NAB could approach. And so it's opened a lot of doors. And um, so I talked to a few people and uh, they said, well, of course, we always wanted that, um, but nobody would do it. And was I had it a previously... sense of fear of, you know, we don't want to... No, no, the thing is that everybody's so busy. I mean, one of the reasons why we had seven people on the panel was because initially I had four people. And uh, the next day, two of them dropped out because they were too busy. Um, Congress are incredibly busy and they tend to work around the clock and they tend to work seven days a week. Um, and they also work in isolation. And they very often, a lot of their time is spent alone. So the problem is just taking somebody outside of that to, to, to do that. Now, I'm kind of lucky because I also teach. So I work with the International Chorist Academy. Um, and I felt that I was in a position where I could make this work. And I had, we, I had co-founded the um, Chorist Academy with Warren Eagles. And so I kind of knew a little bit about how this works. And uh, we thought, well, let's push the boat out, see what happens. And three years later, it's, uh, it's growing very nicely and we're diversifying and we're reaching sort of, every day we find um, new, new things that we can do now that we have this professional organization. So the Colorist Society was an idea of three years ago and in the three years since you've been working on building it and is it officially launched at NAB? Is that, uh, or was it launched before? It, it was launched, um, it, was, it was set up as a charity uh, three years ago. But what's big this year, I think, is that we've taken on um, a publicity company, we've taken on um, sort of extra stuff. So up until now, it was all volunteers. But now we've hit sort of critical mass we, where, uh, you know, I can't do it on my own. So we, we've really started to broaden our horizons in a big way. Now, initially, since you're in the UK, were the members that you reached out, I imagine, first to UK colorists? Actually, not at all, no. I no. mean, it's set up in the US as, as a, um, a, a, a non-profit, 501c, 501C yeah. yes. Um, so it's set up here, firstly, because this is the biggest market, obviously, for colorists. I think about a third of the world's colorists are here in the US. So partly that. Um, a lot of the people I was talking to were from the LA market, of course. Um, so that was where it needed representation. So we set it up in the US. It was just um, coincidence that I'm out in the UK. But we have members from Australia, um, all across Asia, Africa even, uh, Russia, um, and the United States. So we're very well represented. And, and how have you reached out to all these various far-flung colorists? Uh, we all know each other. You know, yes. it's a very tight-knit okay. community. Um, and I, again, I, I have the luxury of teaching around the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I meet a lot of these people. My first training missions were in um, Hong Kong and, um, and Asia. So I had meetings there. Um, Warren's based in Australia, so he has good contacts there. Um, of course, we spent a lot of time in the US uh, with, the, with the US fraternity. Um, and of course, coming to trade shows like this. And that's why it's so great being able to do the Birds of the Feather, but also some of the meetings we do on the trade, on the booths. And we get the colorists together and we try and agree and then move the whole industry forwards. Well, I know that you said that you all agree on the same principles. What are those principles? Spell out a little bit about what you'd sure. like to, to see. Well, um, in, in the telecine days, life was pretty easy because we really only had, we were only working for television. 
So there was only one standard and you got yourself a very nice calibrated monitor, then you were done. Right. But nowadays with, um, you know, if you're doing HDR, we know that you're gonna need an HDR and an SDR. If you are doing theatrical release, we know there's gonna be some sort of disc release, there's probably gonna be a streaming release. So we need to be able to have one master from which all the others come. And we, we believe very strongly in the principle of ACEs. Not necessarily that you have to use ACEs, but this principle that you need to work at the resolution of the camera and preserve all the data through the pipeline and then only convert it to the deliverable formats after the grading and the visual effects and everything is finished. And that way we have content that will sit in an archive and not need to be remastered every three or four years when new formats and new color spaces and, and all this comes on. So that's the big change and it requires everybody to buy into that workflow. You can't just turn up with us and give us a, you know, a flattened ProRes right. because then we don't have the data to make that work. Well, it seems like your natural allies would be cinematographers. Absolutely. Yeah. How has that, um, have you contacted various cinematography societies? Yeah. I mean, um, Academy ACES is, is a sponsor of the Color Society International. Excellent. In most countries, the cinematography groups work very tightly with us. We often um, work together at events and so on. So uh, they are really our first line um, because they have the same interest that we have in just preserving their artistic intent through the chain. Um, and delivering that to the customers. Well, I would imagine they would because I know one of the issues is, of course, they would every single one of them like to be in the final grade, but they sometimes are on other jobs. And yes. then they just have to cross their fingers that the colorist is going to retain the... Well, intent. in the old days, it was finger crossing, but with this new color managed workflows where you try and preserve all of the camera information all the way through, it's much easier for us as colorists to see what they saw on set and usually now there would be a discussion between the, um, either the cinematographer or the DIT or possibly the director, but usually the cinematographer, to decide what direction we're going. It may not be exactly how it's going to be finished, but, but we would already have a discussion about what direction it's going to go in. Or sometimes they'll use charts and um, other indicators so that uh, there's better communication now than there ever was before. Well, and of course, ACES would be the ideal communication, wouldn't ACES it? ACES is, I, I'm a big fan of ACES um, because not only does it work um, and it preserves all these principles, but it's very robust. There's so many people buying into it now that um, everybody knows how to work that. Well, that seems like a, I'm, I'm glad the Academy is supporting your efforts. Yes. Um, what are the next steps of the Colorist Society? Um, there's a couple of different directions. Um, the first one is that we're talking very closely with IMDB because IMDB uh, does list colorists, but not in any one department. So if you want to know who the colorist was on a particular job, um, it's really looking for a needle in a you haystack. You know, that is, off, that is true. I write articles all the time where I have IMDB Pro, but even mm -hmm. so, you have to search and search yeah, sometimes. Yeah, it could be in editorial, could be in visual effects, sometimes it's even in the camera department. So they are very receptive and they understand the problem and they agree that there should be a colorist category. It's really more of an architectural issue for them. Um, they have to write code and, and uh, so it will happen, but it's gonna take a little time. So that's one direction. And then the other direction is that we're now big enough that we're setting up local chapters. So we have a group in Moscow, for example, that, that uh, are dealing with the Russian market. Um, I'm going to Montreal in a couple of weeks time. There's a big um, community there of colorists. Uh, just before NAB, there was a local meeting in New York. And so this is just sort of empowering the local cars to get together in ways that could have happened before, but it just needed that spark. Right, and right. That's where we're at. And I'm presuming there's a local Los Angeles group as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, at the moment, Able Cine are running um, monthly meetings um, for colorists. And uh, so we, we've been joining in with those. So I understand there's a possibility of an awards program down the road as well. Talk about that. Yes, well, we, we very much want to have our own awards program. It'll start off small, um, and we're working on that to make it a, a high profile um, an award. The, the main incentive is really to produce case studies and to show um, to a wider audience exactly what the colorist contributes to the project. It's not just a technical process 
Um, and we'd like to tell that story. We think it's a story worth telling. Absolutely, I totally agree, and I hope that I'm invited to the first award ceremony. Absolutely. So, are, do you have, in terms of governments, I imagine as a 501c, you have like a board of directors, or yes. um, so who's involved aside from you said Abel Cine is involved, and the Academy is involved. Who else have yes. you? So those are sponsors, but also. Um, our first sponsor was FSI, Flanders Scientific. Uh -huh. um, they've been very supportive, um, but we have companies like Black Magic, uh, Dolby. Um, a lot of the, uh, most of the uh, color manufacturers are very supportive uh, because it's in their interest. Uh, uh, again, they said to us right when we started, we need to know what colorists think, and we can go out and, and talk to our markets. But we talk to a hundred colorists, we get a hundred opinions back. Right. We need a body that will discuss behind closed doors and come to um, a democratic decision about what our priorities should be and how we should do things. And so we're, that's where we're working. What, uh, do you, are you releasing membership numbers? How many people are? We have, um, I think we have about 400 members total now. And of those, about 300 are um, what we call full members. So full members are validated colorists. Right. And the joining requirements are a minimum of three years full-time professional experience. And we're trying to just differentiate those colorists that are full-time colorists and can therefore deliver. And with the Color Society, they have access to all the other members. So they're given a directory. They can call any of the other members and say, look, this is the first time I've dealt with this camera or this is the first time I've done this. And so there's this huge support network for them. And we're trying to separate the professional level from you know, the guy in the bedroom with a laptop. Right, and I presume that this also extends to um, students. I mean, I know we're, we have to wrap up shortly, but do tell okay. us a little bit about sure. the Well, the, 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 categories, the, um, the categories are full membership. There's a fellowship, which is a, an honorary position. Um, people like Charles Point and Lou Levinson, Dale Grant, sort of founders of, of what we've done. People who've contributed not just good work, but also given back to the industry. But there's an associate for um, uh, students and an alliance membership for cinematographers and people who have a relationship with colorists but are not going to qualify as a colorist themselves. Lovely. So next year, if we sit here and talk, will we have had an award ceremony already? Uh, we won't have had the award ceremony by then, but um, certainly we would like to think that we would be at the judging stage, yes. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming in and, and keeping us up to date. Where should we go to find out more information? The website is coloristsociety.com and you can find all, everything you need to know about joining, about the membership, everything is on there. Wonderful, thank you so much, and I hope to see you again next year. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. You're with uh, NAB Show Live, brought to you by Broadcast Beat. I'm your host, Deborah Kaufman. We'll be back in just a few minutes.